Hello, my name is Raymond de Oliveira. My name is Francesca Audia. My name is Andy Zhang. And we'll be presenting our plan to foster green innovation. An emissions scenario calculates greenhouse gas emissions for a set time frame by modeling social, political, technological, and economic trends, as well as net emissions from natural processes. Some scenarios assume aggressive international abatement commitments, such as the scenario B1. Some make assumptions on what policies are politically feasible and likely, while others attempt to model a business-as-usual scenario, such as scenario A2, in lieu of abatement policy beyond what has already been implemented. You can see the ranges of carbon dioxide emissions predicted by each scenario in this image provided by the IPCC. As you can see, the A2 scenario leads to a world in which there is more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than the B1 scenario. Emission scenarios are the input used by a climate model to calculate atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations. These concentration predictions are then used to calculate radiative forcing, which in turn allows the climate model to calculate the end product, global temperature change. Climate models give temperature predictions in a large range. There are many sources of uncertainty in the model, such as the unknown degree of climate sensitivity and feedback loops. We rely on Table 3.1 in the IPCC's fifth assessment report for our climate model data due to the unsurpassed peer review data that has been consolidated. The best estimate predictions range from 1.8 degrees Celsius to 4.0 degrees Celsius. Above 2 degrees Celsius, the effects of climate change manifest in res resource shortage, more intense and frequent disasters, and human health impacts. Climate change will affect the United States unevenly across regions and demographics. The socioeconomically under-equipped will suffer more due to less access to resilient infrastructure and less options to adapt to the instability caused by rapid change, and different state resources will result in different sectoral impacts. For the government, there will be less tax revenue and higher public infrastructure maintenance costs due to faster capital depreciation. Overall, the economic effect of climate change continues to be underestimated due to the lack of quantitative studies on indirect and induced effects. Most cost predictions focus on direct costs due to ambiguity among the climate models and, as a result, are conservative. Despite this bias, however, billions in damage to a majority of economic sectors is likely. Now we will present several political failures, international and national. Although the Kyoto Protocol was signed by President Clinton, it wasn't ratified by the United States Senate and thus was not binding. The Kyoto Protocol fails to create an international prisoner's dilemma scenario. For the United States, the perceived costs of the Kyoto Protocol dwarf the perceived benefits, even if every nation committed to it. One illustration of this can be seen in the Kyoto Protocol commitments made by other developed nations, such as Germany, Russia, and the United Kingdom, in which their seemingly significant goals were incurred disproportionately small costs due to nation-specific and one-off situations. Because the U.S. and China and other developing countries perceived itself worse off in an agreement, it chose and continues to choose to act in its own self-interest instead. As a result, international treaties and protocols have been consistently conservative and weaker, both in ambition and in executive reinforcement, than what many scientists claim is necessary. In 1997, the Senate adopted Resolution 98, which urged the President not to commit to international agreements that may harm the U.S. economically, or to commit to goals that developing nations do not share. From this point on, and most notably with President George W. Bush, the U.S. stance in accords and treaties has been an outlying conservative stance that has weakened agreements considerably. By allowing committed nations to meet their abatement goals by reducing emissions in developing countries through sustainable development projects, the clean development mechanism was intended as a supplementary device to lower global abatement costs, help developing countries skip the highly polluting fossil fuel revolution, decrease carbon colonialism in favor of beneficial development aid, and to address the issue of developing nations adding disastrous amounts of carbon dioxide as they try to approach developed countries in prosperity. After a decade of implementation, it resulted in thousands of abatement projects, mostly centered in China and South America, due to their low abatement costs. While they have indeed reduced carbon dioxide emissions, several important imperfections inhibited it from working as intended. The European Union has proposed a reform of the CDM called the Sectoral Crediting Mechanism. However, it does not go far enough to address the shortcomings of the CDM. A reform must address the need to provide a long-term, stable, and transparent market for investors, must simplify and standardize procedures to reduce transaction costs and improve transparency for stakeholders, and must expand project scale to incentivize both smaller and larger sectoral-level projects. So now we will take a look at some of the market failures associated with climate change and climate change policy. First of all, 
Greenhouse gases are an externality on the economy. Firms only consider direct costs and profits of production. They do not consider the indirect costs on the economy. As a result, these indirect costs are not incurred by the producer nor by the consumer, resulting in a quantity of pollution produced that is not socially optimal. The second market failure is the tragedy of the global commons, or the free rider issue. In essence, climate change policy benefits everybody, but not everyone will pay the cost of abatement. For example, if the U.S. enacts a degrowth movement to reduce the effects of climate change, the economic cost of degrowth will only affect the U.S., yet the entire world benefits from the American climate change policy. This results in a two-level international game, as proposed by Robert Putnam. Domestically, the negotiator takes into account the concerns of large international influences. Internationally, the negotiator seeks outcomes that are likely to be accepted and ratified by international influences. International treaty agreements occur when the wind sets among nations overlap. Due to the vast varieties of domestic influences, especially in regards to climate change, international negotiations are often unfruitful. In addition, since there is no international authority, events such as carbon leakage can occur, where countries move greenhouse gas-heavy industries to countries with lenient climate change policies. Now, let's take a look at the policy options available to solve the climate change issue. We will look at existing policies and how we will analyze how each one lacks. First, let's start off with basic marginal analysis. As you can see, the graph is concave, which means that the more we abate, the more costly it will be to abate an additional unit. It is also important to note the no regrets region. An area of the graph that is below the x-axis is called the no regrets region, where the cost of abatement is negative. In Germany, studies have found that the building sector has negative abatement costs. This means that it is profitable in the long run to enact certain abatement projects. However, these opportunities are hindered by lack of information, inaccessibility to capital, long payback periods, etc. The second part of the framework is the marginal benefit curve, or the MBC. This curve depicts the economic benefits of additional abatement. The graph is downward sloping, which shows that the marginal benefit decreases as more greenhouse gases are abated. The intersection between these two curves is the socially optimal level of abatement. However, this equilibrium is rather ambiguous due to varying econometric models and differing calculations of marginal abatement costs. We presented this simplified model to get at the heart of our policy proposal mentioned later. Now, let's analyze a few current policies. First, a cap-and-trade policy is a limit on emissions that is set by the government authority, and companies are free to trade at the unused portion of their limits. This thereby increases emissions price. But most importantly, cap-and-trade is represented by a shift along the MAC curve, which may result in a scenario that is not socially optimal. In addition, the effectiveness is debated, since emissions grew in the European Union despite the European trading scheme. Next, we have the simple carbon tax. This is just a pre-specified tax rate per unit of greenhouse gas emission. It is much more transparent and clear than a cap-and-trade policy like the ETS. In addition, the revenue from a carbon tax can be used for further abatement projects. There have been success in Australia, where it has been implemented, despite slight GDP drops of 0.68%. However, just like a cap-and-trade policy, a carbon tax increases the price of emission, which is represented by a shift along the MACC curve. The third option is tax incentives for green R&D and innovation. In South Korea, there is a tax credit of 20% for large companies and 30% for medium to small companies for R&D activities in four key environmental areas, as seen on the slide. However, there are also problems with tax incentives. Tax incentives result in companies developing patented technology. Therefore, developing countries where abatement is often the most cost-effective do not have access to this green tech for decades afterwards. Now, we will summarize some of the major issues associated with these policies. First, the price rises of carbon with, of the carbon tax and the trading scheme result in an increase in quantity abated. Movements along the MAC curve result in deviation from socially optimal abatement levels, where the marginal abatement cost equals the marginal benefit curve. Step 2. Carbon leakage or pollution havens result from differences in climate change policy among countries. 3. Domestic policies are often insignificant in affecting the world's climate change issue without more countries committing to binding targets. 4. There are political aversions to international treaties, especially the Senate Resolution 98 and the free rider issues mentioned previously. 5. Developing countries' inaccessibility to innovative green tech. Now, with these problems, we will begin to move on to our policy aim. We hope to promote green technology exchange, incentivize domestic green technology R&D, circumvent international political game, 
keep carbon leakage below 100%, fix loopholes in existing policy, allowing for higher transparency, and inhibit carbon colonialism and perverse incentives. So what's the theory behind this? The marginal benefit curve cannot shift. Therefore, shifts of the marginal abatement cost curve are superior to shifts along the marginal abatement cost curve. We reason that technological growth provides superior shifting of the MACC curve, allowing for perpetual growth of quantity abated. This can be achieved through more efficient carbon capture technology and more efficient photovoltaic cells. Therefore, our policy is to incentivize green tech R&D and usage through the joint crediting mechanism. Introducing the joint credit mechanism, an improved CDM on the national level. Japan aggressively tackled climate change after giving up on the Kyoto Protocol. One of the policies is JCM, which fights the flaws that many nations found in the CTM. The basic premise remains the same. Set the national abatement goal and try to reduce emissions in a sustainable way where it is cheapest to do so. Because developing nations will grow and because they tend to lag behind in technology, without a mechanism like the JCM, many nations will develop using last century's dirty and energy inefficient technology. By helping them develop clean the first time, we not only reduce the number of coal factories that need to be torn down in 2030, but we also export our domestic attitude towards the environment. Economically, the JCM allows for domestic firms operating under climate change regulation to invest where the marginal abatement cost is lowest instead of forcing them to improve already efficient factories at home. Leaders familiar with the old CDM had some serious concerns. Every CDM project in every country had to be approved and monitored by an international executive board. Heavy and opaque bureaucracy created high overhead costs and thin relationships with the locals that the projects would affect, which sometimes led to exploitive large-scale tree plantations that used up valuable agricultural land. Ineffective measurement methods overstated the benefits of projects, when in fact less than 1% of all projects actually had measurable sustainable development impacts. Due to abatement centering in China and Latin America, where it is cheapest, the poorest nations in sub-Saharan Africa did not receive any of the benefits from the program. The JCM addresses all of these concerns. There is no international bureaucracy in the JCM. Instead, planning and oversight of projects in each country is decentralized. Whenever a developing country opts into the JCM, the U.S. and the host country will create a joint committee that consists of national regional level representatives. Since there is a separate joint committee linking each developing country to the U.S., decisions will be made with more attention to the local citizens and with more local expertise. Projects will be approved faster, communities will have more influence, and overhead per project will cost less than under the CDM. Verification of supposed project benefits will be easier and more accurate due to the more local oversight. Finally, whereas Congress has shown complete disapproval of the U.S. entering international abatement commitments, the new JCM is a national-level plan. The U.S. can choose which countries to work with. 1. Set an emissions goal. 2. To meet these goals, cap firm emissions and allow them to earn emission credits through a program like the JCM. 3. Focus tax credits for green technology on research instead of green tech manufacturing and consumption. Because emissions can already be reduced in developing countries using current technology, the JCM alone won't incentivize the kind of research that shifts the MAC curve. By learning from South Korea's effective research incentives, we promote innovation in our domestic green industry, as well as focus on shifting rather than sliding along the MAC curve. This innovation will cause no immediate emission reduction, but most efficiently and exponentially reduce emissions before 2050. While the tax credits may strain government's budgets in the short run, spurring innovation will likely create an economic boom. Internationally, not only do we help developing nations skip the disastrous fossil fuel revolution, we also indirectly spread our clean development values. When developing countries no longer need our aid, they will continue to develop cleanly on their own. Finally, by acting proactively, the U.S. will also inspire developed countries to enact similar policies, just like how Japan's JCM influenced our proposal. This chain reaction multiplies the abatement effect of our policy without the need for an international treaty. Political obstacles to climate change policy remain potent. Congress has yet to show commitment to setting emission goals, and policy riders necessary to garner support for proposals weaken and negate the benefits of good policy. Fortunately, while our plan may be currently unfeasible at the national level, 20 states already have emission goals and are ready to enact some form of JCM. Our plan can gain traction at the state level before passing Congress, as so many environmental policies have done in the past. Our proposal is very flexible. The U.S. can choose who to partner with and what percentage of emission credits can be earned abroad. 
States can give firms credits for meeting secondary criteria in their project results. For instance, if we value sustainability instead of just strictly reducing emissions. Many voluntary and governmental carbon trading markets are already in place locally across North America, and the JCM can easily link these programs together. All abatement policies will require a cost, but developing technology and promoting green investment will likely cost less while providing superior benefits. And with that, we conclude our policy presentation. Thank, Thank you. you.